Hello everyone, Catherine Shippier here, still filling in for Mr. G while he's gone. So, um, today, we're talking about very, very, very unusual animals. I say unusual, because at first, you might not even realize they are animals. That's right. Today, we're talking about those animals that look like plants. So, yeah. A long time ago, during the dawn of life, it was all pretty homogenous. Plants and animals were pretty much indistinguishable from each other at first. Sure, they had different feeding methods, since, as you know, plants make their own food while animals have to actually search for it. But, you couldn't tell them apart just by looking at them. But as time went on, animals became more mobile and became a lot more distinguished from plants. Except for these guys, who are like the last remnants of a forgotten time. All these animals are basically stationary and are lacking many complex things like brains or really anything besides a stomach. However, despite their similar appearances, these groups do have their own unique behaviors. So let's get to them. First, let's start with coral, probably the most plant-like animal on the planet. They're closely related to anemones and jellyfish, making up the Nideria phylum. Coral are also one of the most diverse groups of animals on the planet, as they come in all sorts of varieties. You got fan coral, brain coral, table coral, fire coral, bubble coral, and more. However, regardless of what they are, most coral have a similar origin. Coral reproduce asexually, with, ad with adults squirting their eggs into the water, where the current takes them away. Then they settle on a rock and turn into a polyp, which eventually joins up with other pieces of coral to form the structures that most people are familiar with. So yeah, very plant-like. In fact, some coral actually do eat by photosynthesis thanks to their symbiotic relationship with algae feeding them when the algae eats. Now at first, coral might not seem like something that would be eaten, but some animals do actually dine on them. Like there's the crown of thorns starfish and the parrotfish, which eats the coral, digests the soft bits, and then excretes the rocky and edible parts, which becomes part of the sand. Coral are a very important creature. In large groups, they make up coral reefs, which is an entire ecosystem. Yeah, how many other animals do you know that are an ecosystem? With the largest being Australia's Great Barrier Reef, which is the same size as some countries. In addition, coral provides defenses for smaller creatures, since larger predators like sharks tend to not go near reefs. So yeah, coral's pretty important. Next we got sponges, and if you thought coral was primitive, you haven't seen anything yet. Sponges have been around since the Precambrian, and in fact, they may very well have been the first animals to have ever evolved after the days of single cells. Anyway, sponges are similar to coral in several ways, mostly by being sedentary animals that reproduce asexually, but sponges have a few key differences. For example, they have literally no organs, not even tissue. Their skin is only a single cell deep. As for their diet, sponges are pretty much sentient filters, absorbing microscopic organisms into themselves in order to eat. In fact, sponges are very important for the health of coral reefs, as they help filter out bad things that could, uh, threaten the health of coral. So yeah, sponges are pretty darn important, despite their simplicity. Also, there's freshwater sponges. A lot of people don't know that, so I'm bringing it up. Finally, we got tunicates, probably the least plant-like animals, mostly because, uh, well, as you can see by this picture, a lot of them look like some sort of organ. It's honestly kind of gross to look at. Yeah. Some of these guys actually do stuff, unlike the other groups, but still don't really move. Although one notable tunicate is the predatory tunicate, which can best be described as an animalian Venus flytrap, since it's a creature that stands still all the time until something brushes by its mouth, at which point it clamps down and eats whatever came in. So, yeah, like I said, they're, they're like a Venus flytrap. Let's look at some cards. Alright, they only gave cards to two of these guys. First off, we got Fire Coral. And yeah, pretty good. No complaints. And then we got one for the Predatory Tunicate. Again, can't think of anything wrong here. As for human relations, uh... Humans are not very kind to coral reefs. They, um, uh... Do a lot of stuff that causes coral to bleach and then die. Which is bad, because coral is very important. Um, so, yeah, that's a bad thing. Uh, yeah. Sponges were the inspiration for, well, you know, sponges. So, there's that. And tunicates? Yeah, nobody cares about tunicates. In captivity, these guys are pretty common, although in captivity most coral is fake, since real coral, uh, takes a while to grow and, uh, can be pretty difficult to take care of, so most of the coral you see in fish tanks is fake, so there's that. 
Due to their simplistic nature, uh, pop culture doesn't really feature these guys as much besides background objects, with one major exception, that of course being SpongeBob SquarePants, which features a talking sea sponge, of course. Also, the show sometimes features coral as food, although the show is weirdly inconsistent as to if coral is food or not, because sometimes it is, but other times it's betrayed as like the equivalent of eating tree bark or something like that. Yeah, but then again, this show is very inconsistent anyway, so I'm not going to dwell much on it. As for Spongebob himself, I feel like we have a Tasmanian Devil or Roadrunner situation, where because he's so famous that other people are afraid of using sea sponge characters in fears that it'll be seen as a ripoff. So there's that. Well, that's all for this episode of Monsters of the Deep. See you guys another time. Goodbye.